you welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here, and we are in the same studio finally. Beautiful. <laughs> My guests are in, in the studio. We uh, um, and it's good to have you as our first uh, as we resume in studio shows. Good to have you here. Thank you. Honored to be here. Well. I don't know about the honor, but I, you know, I'm not good with, with compliments, but thank you for working hard on this show. Um, definitely interested in, in talking to you on multiple levels today. First and foremost, I have to ask you point blank. Uh, we're like nine, 10 weeks into the pandemic. Yes. So, uh, how are you getting through it? <laughs> well, um, how's the stay at home work, <laughs> working for you? <laughs> well, I'm not the, I'm not the typical person. Like you put me in a room by myself, my mind starts going and I start creating things. So, um April 3rd, I was let go from Entercom Communications right. and I I love the people there, the radio personalities and and I was I was a little sad about it. And at the same time, I'm like, well, I'm okay for a while, mm -hmm. you know, in my rainy day savings, so I'm okay. And now's the time that I can use to do something I've always wanted to do. And that was to share inspirational stories. And the first couple of days into the pandemic, I was getting anxiety, watching the news, like eyes glued to the TV, listening to the radio, right. just trying to figure out what the next steps are, what's going on. You know, I wanted to know what's going to happen just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, well, I need to disconnect. So um, I took a step back and I didn't want to live in a fear, fear based mindset that the media was pushing. And I wanted to use that time to create um, two things that I wanted to do was okay. um, an e-commerce website, my functional holistics, which mm -hmm. I believe in that stuff, you mm -hmm. know, healthy stuff for your body, healthy healing. And then also the one on one with Jamie Chesney, which I had a PowerPoint for that for over a year, right. presented it right. back in January 2019 to the advertising director for Group One Automotive, Joe Caponegro. Right. And he said, Jamie, yes, I'll be on your show. So that was great. I was so excited to get that rolling. And then life happened last year, worst year ever. And I didn't have the opportunity. So mm -hmm. when this pandemic happened. Pandemic. <laughs> you caught that. <laughs> I have not heard it that way. Oh, well, the, you, the, the, I have some things for the, you. Then. The pandemic. Okay. Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. That's so, good. So I've when, not heard that. When this happened, I thought, well, you know, how often do you, do you get time? all this time in life you know we're so busy from one thing to the next right. I better use this time wisely and create the reality that I want mm -hmm. and I'm ba a big believer in manifesting your own reality so right. that that's what led me to um, starting a couple of the websites the e-commerce site and the one-on-one -on -one with Jamie Chesney show which I had two interviews already and with I, great people I saw that already <laughs> the um, you had the podcast uh, or the concept of a show, you, you already had that done a year ago before the the pandemic. The pandemic just set you in a mode to you know to like you said be more creative. Is that, is that right? Well, actually, even before then, okay, Eric. Um, back in 2013, I used to run an online magazine called In Your Face MMA, right? Where I was a martial artist and a competitor, but I saw a need for the fighter, the mm -hmm. fighter to get their story out. Because a lot of people think, you know, it's just a one person show when it comes to fighting, but there's a lot more that goes into it. And I just wanted to get them some recognition. And I, I went to school for design and know how to put a website right. together. And I like to write, so I would tell their story. And I've interviewed some of the, the local legends here. Mm -hmm. And that went really well for a couple of years. and. Then I got a boyfriend, and you know, <laughs> I'm like, I better give him my attention, or I won't have a boyfriend. Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah. Is that how it works? I <laughs> didn't know that. Boys need a lot of attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard. That's what I've heard. So. Well, there's so many areas I, I want to go in with you. The, the first is, um, oh boy. How, how much Netflix have you ingested? <laughs> well, in the beginning, there was a few shows that I binged on. Okay. <laughs> I have to ask everybody on this show. But that's like a standard question on this show now. Yeah. It's a shame. That's the reality of it. Yeah. Well, since I've been... Um since I've launched these two sites, yeah. I haven't been watching much TV at all. So, yeah. You, you, and that's good. I think most creative people... Um, probably went through the fear that we talked about off camera. We both kind of had when it started, and then you hunker down and 
you end up succumbing to television, but then that creative bend, once you calm your nerves, the creative bend kind of comes and takes you back in a direction that you were prior. Is that what happened to yes. you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's a reoccurring theme too. The, the, the folks we've had on this show since the pandemic, uh, they shared like the initial fear for the first couple of weeks. Like mm-hmm. we just didn't know what the hell was going on. And then once we catch our breath and look at the landscape and make a judgment of what we think might be really happening uh, or how it's being un- in, uh, uh, given for us for ingestion, it's uh, it's time to get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. And I think that's what we're doing. Part of I hope what we're doing here today on the show is getting on with it. Yeah, like you can move it or lose it. You got to keep moving in life, and, that, and they want us to stay inside. That just doesn't work for me. Um, you're a Pittsburgh native, right? <laughs> yes. Grew up in Northside. Is that correct? Yes. Like, what was that like? That was a good time. I went to Catholic school, so my Catholic mom... Catholic <laughs> school? In the north, north side. side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, from St. Leo's to St. Peter's to Risen Lord and North Catholic. Right. And then in 10th grade, well, 11th grade, second week in 11th grade, I'm like, yeah, school's not for me. Right. My mother's like, what? <laughs> she didn't know what to do with me. And so I'm like, mom, let's sign me out and I'll get my GED and go to college. She was like, what? She was like, let's try homeschooling first. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to do homeschool for the next two years and then go to college. I said, you know, so in North Catholic, I went there. My my dream was to be in design. Right. And they made me take Spanish. I'm like, I'm on fourth level Spanish. I'm good at that. I'm getting A's. I want to focus on c- communication arts. Right, right, right. And they wouldn't let me. I'm like, well, screw school. And <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> and my mom caught me cutting school, and she's like, what am I going to do with you? So she was like, oh, yeah? You, I'm spending all this money on North Catholic, and you cut school? You're going to all over. Ooh. I remember I was afraid. Like, we had to go through metal detectors. That was a new concept then. Right. And one day I wanted to meet my friends at lunch, and you had to walk up these steps in the back to go by the field. And the steps, all the, all the girls were sitting butt cheek to butt cheek and wouldn't let me through. And I'm like, this is so rude. I'm like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. And I'm like muscling my way through to get to the top of the steps. I'm like, oh, if I stay here much longer, it's not going to be pretty because I'm not going <laughs> to tolerate that. So I um, I signed myself. I got convinced my mother to sign me out of high school. Okay. Which, I'm her youngest daughter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sure that was went over just fine. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know what to do with me. And then I said, okay, I'll, I'll go get my GED. I passed it on the first time. Okay. First try, and then I went to college. How about that? Yeah. Signed yourself out of school, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And you went to school where? Um, the Art Institute. All right. With graphic design. I have my Bachelor's of Science. Right. And I studied advertising also. That was my minor. Mm-hmm. All my electives were in advertising, mm-hmm. and I ended up going into advertising. When I, when I look at your persona, and for the years that I've known you, you're, it's, you're a fighter to me. Uh, you're a fighter as a person, but you are a fighter. <laughs> so my question is, uh, and you're you're in the fight game. You're you're in that medium. You're in you're in in very capa- various capacities. Where was your first, um, or when was your first interest in either martial arts, fighting, the combat? Was it young? Well. <laughs> My mother did say that the doctor couldn't believe how much I kicked. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it started a lot sooner than that. But, I mean, yeah, my cousins and I, we were rough. We, we were fighting in the streets, fighting the, the neighborhood boys. You know, it would be me against two boys. Or, it was the north side. <laughs> it was the north side. I mean, and then we were friends, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, that's the north side. That's the north side. I was jumped a few times. And um, I asked my mom when I was in elementary school. I want to do more shorts. Look at this kickboxer movie. Look at Van Damme. Look at Jackie Chan. Mom, I got to do this. She's like, no, <laughs> I'm not putting you in that. <laughs> so when I was 16, oh, actually, I started working when I was 15 right. at the local Giant Eagle. And it was like a 10 minute walk from the house. And my mom was fine with me walking home. I was walking home one day and I, I got jumped by hmm. three girls. One girl took off her high heels and was hitting me in the face. Ouch. Yeah, it was bad. I was in the fetal position on the ground. It started off, the one girl was like, hey, are you Jamie Chesney? And I'm like, yeah, hi. You know, no clue what was coming my way. Wow. And um, I was standing on the curb, and the girl walked up to me, asked me if I was who I am, and the girl behind her pushed me. 
and then street smarts kicked in. I'm like, I better get my hits in now. So I threw the first punch. <laughs> but I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. So yeah. I had to get my hits in and because I saw the girl have her high heels. I knew yeah. she was going to hit me. Right. So I was in the fetal position and on the ground, on the street. And this gentleman that I was working with pulled over and screamed. And this woman pulled over and screamed. And two people, like how brave of them right. to pull over and try to help me. And he drove me home, and I had a white shirt on. It was full of blood. No broken nose. I don't know how that happened. But, um, you know, I, I looked at a mess showing up at the front door. My parents were like, oh, my God. They called the police. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, that I was afraid to leave my house for two weeks. No, wait, wait, you were a junior in high school? Were you a sophomore, freshman? Were you younger than um, that? I was a sophomore. Okay. So it was high school age. Yeah, yeah. So I was afraid to leave my house. And, um after two weeks, I heard that the one girl was out a house at a house party, and I'm like, you know what? I gotta go get her. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted my revenge. I was young, you know, full of fire, and I'm, so I knocked on that door. Here, oh, like a whole storm of people were behind me. I'm like, where did you all come from? We're like, well, we heard that you were coming here, and I knocked on the door, and I wanted to say something to that girl. Yeah, and. <clears throat> She wasn't there. The next day, I was at Legion Park with my friends. I had like seven girlfriends with me, and we're dressed all cute, and I have my black eyes and my makeup to cover up my bruises, my sunglasses, and the three girls pulled up. Wow. And I walked over to the car, and I said, hey, the girl's name was Bobby Joe. Hey, Bobby Joe, why did you jump me? And she looked around, and I th I'm thinking my seven, eight girlfriends are right by me. They're like 40 <laughs> feet away. I'm like, where'd you go? <laughs> you know, like, so here I am with these three girls that jumped me previously. And Bobby Joe looked at me, looked down, picked up a baseball bat, and goes, I'm about to hit you with my Louisville slugger. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> so from there, um, I talked to a couple of my friends, Matt Himber and TJ Husser. I went to North Catholic with them. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, Jamie, we're going to this boxing gym out in Churchill, PK oh. Academy. You should come. They have kickboxing. And I showed up there and I fell in love. Immediately. Immediately. I fell in love. So your mother is... I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't. Well, I can't imagine. But your mother was was she happy? Was she not? Was she like, what the hell are you doing? Well, I mean, she did catch us partying a few times, you know. And like a lot of my friends growing up in the North Side, they got into drugs. Mm -hmm. I got into kickboxing. Mm -hmm. A little healthier. Yeah, so definitely a healthier. She option. supported me. She right supported on. me very much. So, did you, did you like the martial? art aspect of it or did you prefer the actual combat aspect because i always ask martial artists that was were you, were you attracted by the discipline of the art or were you attracted by the combat nature of combat what you're nature. Doing? <laughs> why am i not surprised <laughs> why am i not surprised and how long did you if you how long did you study what does it well I'm, I'm assuming the discipline was taekwondo no oh i started off in boxing and kickboxing just for like a month okay and they said that you couldn't kick to the legs and I said, why? Oh. It didn't make any, you can only kick above the waist. Why? You got a whole leg there. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, kick yeah. him in the leg. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you learned Muay Thai? I learned Muay Thai. Well, um, a friend of mine, <laughs> her, her father said to me, you need to talk to Kieran Wolf. He's okay. from Ireland. Okay. He is a World Kickboxing Association champion right who fought all over Ireland and England. Right on. And he's a, he said he was in an old school in, in Bellevue. I don't know if you know Bellevue, PA. Oh, yeah. And the, it was on Grant Street. It's called the Grant Street Community Center. Mm -hmm. He said, go in the basement there. It's run by John Brunick. I show up there, you know, 16 years old with my mom, my sweatband, <laughs> my Nike sweatband, because I know I'm ready to sweat. <laughs> and, and there's like a bunch of 30-year-old men. The floors were plywood, not finished. There was a boxing ring with blood stains in it. Nice. I was the only female. Wow. And they gave me my own little bathroom. Kieran looked at me, and he goes, how did you hear about me? And I'm like, Bob Ravel. He's like, all right, I'll train you. And I was smoking cigarettes, you know, and trying to fight. And so Kieran goes running with me and he goes, are you smoking cigarettes? And I'm like, well, just a little. And you stop, you know. And so I quit smoking right well, then and there. On the spot. On the spot so I could fight. How about that? Yeah. So now, Muay Thai, talk a little bit about that for those who don't know that discipline. I have a <laughs> – I was exposed to it very briefly. It's extremely oh. brutal. Yes. And it's uh, I, the pain to the shins was just so 
Listen, my shins Bru- are lumpy to this yeah, day. Yeah, brutal, <laughs> brutal, brutal. And well, I knew right away it wasn't for me. But talk a little bit about that discipline. Well, Muay Thai is called the Art of Eight Limbs. That it originated in Thailand, and it was the national sport. To where every year on the king's birthday they would hold this great event, this great Thai boxing event, and it would go into the military. Also, there are other aspects of it that mm-hmm. are a little more than just the combat sport. Okay, it's like full you know contact okay. you know it's very um brutal using the eight limbs meaning the legs two legs two knees two hands and two elbows mm-hmm. and there's a lot of clinch work in it mm-hmm. um <laughs> Now you put a Muay Thai fighter against a wrestler, which I experienced in my first mixed martial arts fight. Mm -hmm. Um, They take your weapons away. You can't knee a wrestler in the head. (laughs) I wasn't allowed to knee. Darn. Yeah, there goes my, my, you know, and the Muay Thai fighter is more upright. They're more upright compared to a wrestler where they have like that crouching position. So I ended up fighting a a 10 year wrestler in my first MMA fight. Really? Yeah, I went the distance all three rounds, but I wasn't allowed to knee her in the face when she dropped levels and my sprawl wasn't that good. I only trained for three months for that fight. You know, on groundwork. All right, now we'll get there. But <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me, uh, so, because uh, it's, it's mind boggling to me that anyone, male or female for that matter, and I've, I've said the same thing to the comma and Adam Milstead and, uh, I, and Chris was just on. I told these MMA fighters in Pittsburgh, I don't care if you're, about your sex. I think it's, it's crazy that a human being will go into a cage <laughs> and mixed martial arts is, pretty much with with some rules but pretty much anything goes it's free form fighting right Mm -hmm. how do you make that leap that you want to do that i mean that's i mean i mean boxing has got a form to it right Mm -hmm. martial arts has a form to it mma is like a what is it it's a combination of all disciplines right Mm -hmm. yes yes so to make that leap i mean for me Starting off in boxing and Muay Thai, that was brutal, you know. Extremely but, <laughs> brutal. <laughs> and, that's upright, though, right? Yeah, that's upright. That's upright. But what made me get into mixed martial arts is, you know, I was 31 years old. I was going through a divorce. Right. And I was training at the, this this ex-CIA guy at a gym in Muay Thai. Okay. So I would show up there three times a week to mm. train this guy. And he loved it. You know, I, I would hold tie pads for a 250 pound guy. I was being lifted. <laughs> and I was in great shape, too. I was teaching a women's fitness class. Right. And the owner of the gym goes, Hey, Jamie, there's MMA fights coming up. Why don't you fight? And I had nine fights to that point right. between boxing and, and Muay Thai and kickboxing. And I said, I don't know ground. Like, I don't, yeah. if, if I would wrestle, it'd be so funny because I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Or, or jujitsu, what? Did you sneeze? God bless you. You know, like, I didn't even know what jujitsu was. Um, so he said, well, I'll train you. And I said, What are you going to train me? Like, how to fight a wrestler or what? He's like, No, we'll, we'll work on your ground stuff, arm bar defense, you know, we'll keep it standing up. And little did I know, I was fighting Jessica Richmond from Philly, mm-hmm. who owned the gym. Okay. She had a boxing background, and she was a wrestler for 10 years in college, you know, and fought her. And in amateur MMA, you cannot knee to the face. So, right. you know, one of, some of my weapons were taken away. But her wrestling was so good, and I only had three months training on how not to be armbarred, <laughs> that she still may have beat me had I had not had the opportunity to use all my weapons. <laughs> so, Spoken I, like a true fighter. <laughs> uh, the wrestling part of it, it let, me, let me ask your opinion. The wrestling part of MMA, because I'm fascinated by this, is that the crux of it? Because you do have competitors with back, uh, mainly a background in boxing, some competitors mainly background in wrestling i get it but in your opinion is mma primarily a wrestler's sport not necessarily i mean yes it's one of the best bases to have because you have the grit you have the drive you've been you know in very tough situations that you had to get out of as a wrestler being on the ground and everything but i i do think it's one of the main bases that you need to have but like look at look from it from my point of view i come from a stand-up background right i had to learn that wrestling so i could be a more well-rounded fighter which mm-hmm. i ended up winning my last two fights because i dedicated more time to wrestling and stayed sharp on my okay. stand-up okay 
It, you just get all kinds of varying opinions on that. But to me, it would seem like the if the upright fighter that's not skilled in wrestling, if he gets to the mat, he's in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Or she's in trouble. Absolutely, right? yeah. You have to have you have to be a well rounded fighter. You really do. And consequently, if you're not a good upright fighter and primarily a wrestler, you you have to get them to the ground because if you have and to stand up don't. and go toe to toe, you're going to get your ass yeah, kicked. Yeah, yeah. And if you're with somebody who could pivot and move when you go to shoot or sprawl, um, you know. I don't think that the wrestler has a great shot if that upright fighter is that good. Mm -hmm. You're still um, training as, as you haven't stopped your training at all. Is that correct? I mean, since this pandemic started, well, I've, I've had to adjust. I've sure. been running hills and um, right. doing yoga and shadow boxing. <laughs> <laughs> so got to have balance, yoga right? Yoga is training. <laughs> yes. <laughs> balance. So um, I, I was sparring, you know, two, three two times a week in addition to taking class. So it's still a big part of your life, oh, whether definitely. or not you choose to, to get the mat or not. I have huge goals in it. Like, I, I want to focus on my black belt. I was going to pay for Stout for a year in advance so mm -hmm. I can be part of their jiu-jitsu program. That's okay. a big goal of mine. I know it might take eight, ten years. Right. Um, hopefully a little less because I have some experience. But, you know, I feel like, you know, getting up in age and everything, um, I didn't do it when I was younger, and I should have. I should have gone and focused the past six years mm -hmm. on jujitsu and got my Why black didn't you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. I was training in Lou Armazani's class, yeah. and I was rolling in gi, mm -hmm. and I grabbed the guy's lapel like this, and he flipped over, and my finger got hung up uh. and snapped it right in half. Mm. I'm like, Lou, fix it. Pull my finger. <laughs> Lou's looking at me like, um... And he went like this or something, and I don't think I couldn't feel anything wow. because I'm brain dead or I'm a numbskull. I couldn't feel it. I had a, adrenaline going. Don't get me wrong; it hurt, but it wasn't to the level where I was going to quit training. I'm in the right. middle of class, right. so I rolled a little bit more, and I'm like, "Yeah, maybe it's kind of hanging there. I don't know." So I wrapped it up, and then I sparred Muay Thai for an hour. Got one it. handed you know I'm like I could still move a fight coming up and I had aspirations because I just came off of a two fight win streak after losing my first two MMA fights my only two losses and my coach at the time Tony Durnell said here's the plan you got two wins we're going to keep this going keep doing your jits we're going to get you into Invicta and then UFC and it was always a hobby of mine, but mm -hmm. okay. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So, um, All sounds good to me. <laughs> but at that point, um, two days later after that happened in class, my finger was like five times the size of it. And I go to the doctors, they're like, we need to operate tomorrow or wow. you can lose it. So they operated, put three pins in, and I had to take some time off to adjust to that. And then a couple months later, it was around Christmas time, and my I'm at a party. I'm sitting on the couch with a bunch of women. It was a little chilly. We all had a blanket, and the kids were playing, and my daughter comes and jumps on my lap, shattered it oh. into five fragments. Oh. So I had to have another surgery, and they it's had... It's always those odd, quirky illnesses, not illnesses, uh, freaky accidents, yeah. right, that take people out. Yeah, it took me out for a, a little digit. bit. And it's a finger. <laughs> the there's digit. there's a, a boxing meme that goes around like, oh, you can't fight because of a broken finger, and I'm like, that's totally me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. But that's what happened. I had that's to have reality, surgery. That's yeah. reality. Right, right, and, right, right, right. And so I had another surgery, and they put um, seven screws and two Oof. plates in it, and then they forgot to give me the local anesthesia mm, how they how did they forget to do that i don't know they put me to sleep and operated on me no pain meds i woke up crying I'm like, eh. oh <laughs> so my god That's a, that, how, I'm, a, I'm horrified <laughs> i'm well, nightmares of that so i'm supposed to go back and get these screws and pins taken out i'm like i'll pass they're still in there right on yeah <laughs> is it is it hampering you now not really i mean it gets a little sore once in a while but mm-hmm I could still make a fist, almost. It's not bad, right? Still hit somebody, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hit with these two knuckles. I teach my classes. I said, these two knuckles. Got it. Front, front two knuckles. You're, you're still teaching? I teach. Well, I was teaching um, kids class every Sunday. I was teaching the fighters mm -hmm. in the Muay Thai. But um, since becoming a judge with the State Athletic Commission for Mixed Martial Arts and Kickboxing, Serb was like, well, because of bias concerns, yeah, you know, please don't teach the fighters. And I'm like, okay. So even though I love them all, like, right. I can't choose a fighter. No, absolutely. I would never be biased. I'm like, if you lose, you lose, whether you use what I taught you yeah. or not. <laughs> I'll talk, talk about that, being a judge. Being a judge? Well, okay, a couple of years ago, Rick Staggerwald, who, yeah. he's a commissioner, mm -hmm. State Athletic Commission, and he called me and he said, Jamie, 
we need a female boxing judge. And at that time, like my house just burned down. I was like, got a lot Your going on. Your house burned down? Yeah, it was like six months after I broke my hand, my house burns down. And <laughs> <laughs> How did we miss that part of the story? <laughs> I mean, I feel bad even asking about it, but your house burned down. Yeah, it was something. So Yeah, that's something. How'd yeah. that happen? My mother. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, mother. No, it's okay. It's, all, it's, just, it's just funny. The way it you is, said it's just funny. It is funny. She was, um, it, you know, it all worked out and to, to sure. benefit me. Absolutely. You know, it's Absolutely. all, it's, it's a blessing. It was a sure. blessing in disguise. I get but it. She smokes, I don't. And she was over my house and I had this screened in back deck. She was out there smoking. And here I was upside down in the basement on this inversion table, right. like Batman. Right. And my right. daughter's with me playing. My other daughter wasn't home. And I hear Jamie, Jamie, get up here. The house is on fire. And I'm like, I'm like, my bearing, grab my kid. I go, Sophia, go to Rick's house across the street. My neighbor, I love him. He was like Wilson from Home Improvement. <laughs> so I'm like, go to Rick's house. Mom, call 911. I go to get the fire extinguisher. It wasn't there. I'm like, are you kidding me? It was always on top of the fridge. So here I am trying to fill up these soup pots to take on the deck, Super. dump in the water. There's no hose that could get there. No hose. So um, it went from, it was a Saturday, mm -hmm. on September 27th, 2014. Wow. It's wow. like four o'clock in the afternoon. Beautiful, not a cloud in the sky. So here I am with these soup pots, trying to put this out on the deck. And the second the outdoor screening caught, I couldn't see a foot in front of my face. Right. It was like thick, Oof. dark smoke. I was coughing it, right. you know, breathing it in, coughing it up. And they say, think about what you would grab if you were in a fire. Mm -hmm. What do you grab? Mm -hmm. I got, maybe a photo album. I don't know. I don't you don't know. think about any of that. I got my people out. I was in my bare feet. Even mm -hmm. left my purse in there. Yeah. I was coughing so badly. I ran out yeah. across the street to where my daughter and my mother were. And I sat there and I watched it go up in smoke and all wow. the firefighters come and in my bare feet. So for two days after that, Rick comes over. He's like, here's some boots. <laughs> Gave me a pair of boots, size 10. Because I wasn't even thinking about going to the store. And I was just trying to see what I could salvage. Right, and right, it, right. it was pretty traumatic. I and, bet. Um, you know, made me a better person and stronger and put mm -hmm. me in a better place. That's a reoccurring theme with people that go through... Uh, devastating house fires where they lose most if not everything yeah. but they always seem to come out the other side better like a life lesson happens there a cleanse I, th I, th I think <laughs> yeah cleanse is probably a good word I think maybe perspective too because yeah. I think you know Americans and probably everyone in this world is pretty fixated with a certain portion of their personal belongings mm -hmm. right and in the end they're just it's just stuff yeah it really was it was 10 years I was in that house for 10 years wow. so mm -mm -mm, that was mm -mm. something to, to really part with stuff. And then I got into Buddhism and Hinduism and non-attachment. And I'm like, I don't need anything. <laughs> Throwing everything away. Minimalism. <laughs> exactly. I was seriously am downsizing. And well, right after that, I bought a house. It was like a 2,500 square foot house and a half acre in McCandless. Right, right. Beautiful. Right. And I filled it up again. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I just got rid of more stuff. So now I'm downsizing to a small apartment, and right that way I can just go when I need to go and yeah, travel. Yeah, lifestyle. I want to focus on travel. Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So we go back to, uh, I got you sidetracked. I asked you about the house fire. Like I was, you know, um, judging. Yes. You were asked to judge. I was asked to judge by Rick Staggerwald. Did you want to do it initially? Um, I was intimidated. Okay. You know, like Greg Serb. I knew Serb because I did promote back in 2005 yeah. i put on a fight promotion um through okay. fenian promotions and i knew serb he knew me he knew me from fighting and i'm like well i don't know if i can do this i don't know if i'm good enough there's always that reoccurring thought in my mind am i good enough to do this mm -hmm. and i'm and i thought about the time and the kids and i'm like i don't know rick i don't know about this and he was like i think you can do it i think you're going to be great I'm like oh, i don't i gotta think about it he calls me back jamie you want to do this? And I'm like, you know what? Why not? Let's do this. I'm going to jump out of my comfort zone. Okay. So I really jumped out of my comfort zone. He's like, call <laughs> Greg, serve now. He's expecting your call. Greg answers. So Jamie, you want to be a judge? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, boxing's filled up. No positions there. You're going to be a mixed martial arts and kickboxing judge. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, well, that's more interesting. <laughs> and so okay. I had to get my license, and he approved it. And then from there, I had to study. 
I had mm-hmm. to learn about the 10 point must system, which I already knew about, right. you know, the judging system a little right. bit. Right. And so it's different, actually. Per- There's a big difference between actually being a competitor mm-hmm. and then actually judging. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, they, they, you look at certain things clean punching or clean strikes, I should say, is number one. Um, ring generalization mm-hmm. and assertive aggression. Assertive aggression. Mm-hmm. I like that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I like that phrase, but I like that phrase. So, okay. So there are the three things that you look for as a judge. And I had to shadow. I had to sit with all the judges okay. for about only three or four shows. All right. And I, I heard, like, people heard that I was a judge. They're like, no, she's not. She's not a judge. And I'm like, <laughs> I guess I am. And then uh, last year at the WFC events at the Rivers Casino, mm-hmm. I'm thinking I'm shadowing, and the deputy director, Mike Arnaz, was there. And he comes over to me. He's like, Jamie, you're going live tonight. I'm like, what? How about that? And I'm like, I'm at the casino, and like all my peers are here, and like that's a great thing. Oh. What's wrong with that? That's I great. was intimidated. I'm like, can I do this? I'm like, I'm gonna do it. I, <laughs> I mean, I know how to fight. I know what to look for. Okay, yeah. okay, I can do this. I just had to stay focused, and I'm focused. You know, with In Your Face MMA, when I ran that magazine, mm-hmm. I sat cage side for two years. We'll talk about that. How? Where did the inspiration for that come from? And what, we, this is the mid 2000s, late 2000s. Oh uh, well, the promotion or the promotion was the promotion was mid 2000s, right? Yes. Okay, yes. well, let's start there. What, what, what gave you the idea that hey, I can I can run a promotion? Well, um, at that time, I had my daughter. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I well, 2004. She was born in 2003. I was training 11 weeks after that while nursing, wow. and then I ended up fighting uh, nine months after that while nursing still. So, okay. <laughs> that, that fight's a, that's a funny story, but um, here I find myself in Richmond, Virginia against Aaron Cantrell, who's like an Amazon, like she had hairy armpits and an afro, like beautiful <laughs> woman though, but that was her style. And she ended up going on to fight uh, <laughs> the okay. Chuck Norris's fight team. Right on. But you know, I'm like in the back room pumping and storing milk before I get in the, the oh fight, my the, God. <laughs> in the ring oh to fight God. this girl. And she hit harder until this day. Nobody has hit me as hard as wow. Anna Cantrell. God rest her soul, she mm-hmm. passed. Okay. Um, yeah, so within the first few seconds of that fight, I got hit by her, and I knew I, I knew I had to leg kick her. So I just beat her all three rounds, and then I fought again the next month uh, against Abigail Yehuda. Okay. Alexander Beck and I went down. We fought. He fought the brother. I fought the sister in a okay. five-round Muay Thai fight, and it turned out to be in an African American strip club in Atlanta. <laughs> My boyfriend, Lexi's father, was there with me. And both my coach and my daughter's father were getting freaked. Well, I'm, in the, I'm like punching a girl in the face, and I'm like, hey, get off him. <laughs> like, you, can't, like, you can't even make that no, up. No. How can you make that up? So I beat her every round, and they announced that she won. Wow. And they, they said, hey, it was a mistake. The announcer's mistake. Everybody booed her because it they announced mis- she won. Like, it was evident I won every yeah, round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the announcer, you know, sometimes that happens. I, I would hope not. Oh, well, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> and so after that, um, I go back to Iron City Gym. Mark Miller was my coach at the time. Mm-hmm. He fought um, <clears throat> a lot of in, in Las Vegas. And K1, have you heard of K1 oh, kickboxing? Absolutely. So he, yep. he fought in K1, him and Alex Beck. And I come to back to Iron City Gym after that. And he was like, I, th- I have some health things. I might retire. He's like, do you want to buy the gym? And I'm like, yeah. So I purchased Iron City Gym, and it was pretty cool. I had that for like a year, did pretty well, and Mm -hmm. then I had internships with work um, or with school. I had an internship opportunity in marketing at Mark USA, which was the third largest marketing firm in the city. So I had to take that, and it just became too much, so it um, kind of moved on from there. And I still wanted to be part of the fight world, even though I was pursuing my dreams in mm-hmm. advertising and marketing. Um, I talked to Joe Cosentino. Joe Cosentino ran Kiski Martial Arts at the time, and I was introduced to him through Mark Miller. And Joe and I hit it off. Like, he's from the north side, I'm from the <laughs> north side. He's old. I met his wife, Jeannie. She's amazing. I still love Joe to this day. He sponsored me. Right. Um, so, Joe uh, was my partner at Fenny and Promotions. Mm-hmm. And he said, Well, let's have it at Ross Draver Ice Garden. Um, I think that we can get it better. I looked into doing it at the convention center, but taxes were just so high right. at the time right. for our budget. Oh, yeah. 
And I got my friend Kit Cope. He was the main event. Kit Cope fought in MTV's K1, I Want to Be a Kickboxer. Mm -hmm. So that show um, bombed. We lost money. <laughs> it was the first one, but I planned it. I was such a planner. I planned it six months in advance, and that was before the Steelers draft and the Green Day concert. All these big things happened on the right. same day before okay. I knew it. Uh, you, can, you can't. Nothing you can do about that. Yeah, so, but the show turned out really well. Like, I had a world title there. Um, <clears throat> and... You know, it was, it was a great experience, but losing money on it did not go well. And we're like, well, if we do this again, we might have to start just amateur for a while, get right. some money in, and then go from there. But I focused on my career, and then I just only taught kickboxing and just worked out for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then when I ended up teaching that guy, XCIA guy at AMS at the time, which is now top tier, that's when I started getting back into kickboxing after the, going through the separation and the divorce. Did... Um... <clears throat> Do you have any background in journalism at all? No. Okay. But what, what made you, because I don't either. I mean, I'm, I'm not judging here. I'm just saying that I think it's fascinating that you wanted to then do interviews or and you wanted to, was it print? Was, was your show? Was, no, no, no. It was just um, an online magazine. I yeah, called it. I yeah. just called so it an online magazine. What made you want to go that direction? I just wanted to get the word out there about the fighter's journey, their struggle, because I knew I had a journey mm -hmm. and it, I didn't really follow the fight world or watch a lot of fights because I was always in school and working and I had a child. Right. So I didn't have time to focus on that. So when I got back into fighting again or training, I, I wanted to just help the fighters get their story out. That was my true intention. Mm -hmm. And it went really, everybody was so accepting of it. Um, you know, my first interviews. Don Mazzotta and mm -hmm. Chris Dempsey and Isaac Greeley and Adam Milstead, Comma Worthy, and some really great people. And I had some great interviews. People wanted to know about them. I think I, I think that is awesome. And I also believe that the public in general, if they have an interest in something, they want to know more about the participants. It's a natural thing that we have. There's a curiosity there. Right. And there's just not a lot of outlets for these folks to get their story out. So I get it. I mean, that's what we do on this show is really about it is about, this show is about the story. Um, how much work was that online magazine? Oh my gosh, <laughs> it didn't even feel like work to me because it was fun. Like you know, I, I like to do websites, well, sure. I like sure. to write, I like to put up pretty pictures. You know, <laughs> yeah, I did all of the above. I mean, and then I said, wow, I should really be. <laughs> I should really be focusing on video, being in digital advertising. Right. Um, they're like, video, video, video. And I'm like, that was the next step. Okay. In 2015, the UFC came. Yeah. And I missed that fight. You I, did? I, I wasn't there because my boyfriend, cause it wasn't his fault. It was mine. Uh -huh. He didn't say, go, don't go to the fight. Don't do yeah. this. Everybody was calling me like, are you coming to these fights? And I'm Relationships, like, huh? <laughs> well, it was my fault. It was my fault for letting that happen. It was, you know. Life. Yeah. It's life. I just didn't want him to feel intimidated. Is MMA, is is the fight world, where are they in terms of technology? And, you know, obviously Dana White and, and uh, UFC is the the center of it all. But once you get past that, um, what's what's the other league? Bella? There's Bella Tour. Bella Tour. Yeah. yeah. As I'm learning, see? Yeah. How... how how far behind the other major the major sports are they in terms of production presentation the whole thing is it not as uniform because there's so many competing well i think i just think it's um one a stepping stone okay. for the ufc you okay. know and sometimes people will go into the ufc and then go back to bellator interesting yeah video is still a huge component and your background is advertising mm -hmm. right so talk a little bit about about the importance of video in presenting fighting. Because when I had fighters on here, they'll say, well, I know there, there's video of my fights, but then some of the fights I've had, there isn't any video for me to watch. And I'm saying to myself, we're near 2020, or maybe this fight took place in 2017. What do you mean there's no video? And he said the budgets are extremely tight in some of these. Oh, yeah, some there's, of these there's not much money. Yeah, and, it, and that, that was such shocking to me because it seems like MMA in general has got the bulk of the a lot of the public's attention mm -hmm. yet you hear that the some of the fights aren't televised well televised is one thing but not even recorded videotape there's just the it, 
somebody's making money, right? I mean, like, this is going to be a lack well, of it, something. It, it's all in how you um comes view down the to the show. promoter? Yeah, it comes down to the promoter and their experience. And, you know, the fighters have to sell tickets. And then yeah, they, you split it's the very tickets. Organic. And, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of it's like social networking, you know. Um, with the fighters selling tickets, that helps. Getting sponsors, mm -hmm. that helps. Mm -hmm. But to not have video, I mean, there are no videos of me and my fights. All my, Well, I have some VCRs. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that is. That's some kind of ancient technology. I'm too I'll, young I'll, to know that. <laughs> Revealing my age, oh, no. But man. with the, I do have some fights that were recorded on VCR. But there was no social social networking when I was fighting as yeah, a girl. Yeah, so you're before that era. Yeah, I was okay. before that era. So maybe. But now though, some of these guys don't have. I don't said, understand I don't that. Really... They should. The promotion should should have. I, yeah, yeah, I was saying myself because UFC's production is very glossy. Joe Rogan is doing commentary. I mean, it's it's you know it's it's hyped. It's amped. It's mm -hmm. and. But once you get past that, I guess Bellator is obviously just a rung below that. Yeah. But then after that... There's all these local promotions. Local. Yeah. It's very local. But even minor league baseball is televised in bigger markets. Mm -hmm. There's like I, I was just surprised that there just was this big drop off, especially with video, because video is a $100 GoPro camera now. You know, yeah. It just seems to be... And I would think from a training standpoint, so if none of your fights were, well, you have some on some, yeah, on some medium we're not going to talk about, <laughs> but how important is video to the training for the fighter? I Very mean, to go important. back and watch what they did, right? Yeah. You have to watch the tape, they say. You have to watch but if the there's tape. no tape, <laughs> I mean, like, that's just You crazy. better be ready. <laughs> <laughs> you better be well-rounded. So... so Talk a bit about how you've seen it all evolve. Like, could you have ever imagined that UFC, that league, would ever be where they're at today? Could you have imagined that like 20 years ago? No, 20? not at all. I mean, well, at that point before social media, um, I didn't even, like I said, I wasn't familiar with jujitsu. And right. I was at Iron City Gym, and this police officer, who Ray, who trained there, was like, Jamie, let me show you some groundwork. And I didn't watch the UFC then, I didn't hmm. watch anything. I did it. I just trained. I trained. I, I trained with the best I could train with, and that's what I knew to do. Train with the best people I could train with. I didn't learn from TV, right. uh, just videos of other fights. So um, when Ray showed me the arm bar, I felt it was pretty, um, what's the word I can use? I felt violated. The arm bar? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't use it. <laughs> I felt violated being it, on the ground because I was a kickboxer, yeah, Muay Thai fighter, and then the guy takes <laughs> my arm and puts it through his crotch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, he has his legs over my face, and then he puts his pelvis in the air, even more so, like the cup I could feel, uh -huh. and, I'm, and then he had me do it. Yeah, and then he was like, "Nice pelvis," and I was just turned oh, off. Oh, that really? Did it. That did it for me with yeah, jujitsu. Now I'm like, I have to get my black belt. I have to focus on this. But right. then, right. Um, I, because it wasn't on TV as much, or I didn't watch that much TV, right. to seeing it evolve. Mm -hmm. Had I been exposed to it through TV and watched it, I think I would have been more comfortable. And just seeing how everything has evolved now, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are more open to that. So if somebody's being introduced to the arm bar, they may not feel violated after yeah. seeing it done by Ronda <laughs> Rousey a hundred million times. <laughs> so. Well, it's it's such a part of the social conscious. So social media, in your opinion, was uh, a lot to do with, with the growth of UFC, do you think? I well, was just... I mean, Cause TV a, and social, yes. Yeah, because I mean, because Major League Baseball, NFL, the hockey, and NBA, the four big ones in this, and then soccer to a lesser extent in the states, huge overseas. Mm -hmm. They already had, they had their footing right. before social media. Social media, and, and some of the leagues, I think, initially struggled on what to do with social media. They weren't good at manipulating it. But it seems like, I and mean, maybe it's because there's social media just loves. It loves the ego and yeah. loves those that have bravado, which is perfect for f the fight game, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's almost a tailor-made advertising source for, for fighters. fighters. And I was told by my coach, he was like, accept all those friends. And it was like 20 men, I don't know, you know? Like now there's the, about a thousand people that I haven't accepted right, right, because right. I don't know them. But at the same time, at that point, I just accepted anybody that didn't seem, mm -hmm. you know, like they weren't a good person. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but that's and that whole social. Let's talk about social media for a second. That whole thing has really evolved uh, over time. Where the friends, if you're, I guess it comes down to personality. I was going to say if you're in business for yourself, if you're not, that may determine who you let in your sphere, your mm-hmm. social media sphere, right? But I think it comes down to really personalities because I know some people that work for companies that just have a personality that they just whatever goes. I mean, they they've got five thousand friends. And they probably know like 300 of them. Right. <laughs> so, and they're okay with that. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. But there are other people that want to examine each and every person that they let in their sphere. Nothing wrong with that either. That went out the window. It did. <laughs> it did yeah. when I was training it, it a lot. Yeah. And I get that. So, but a friend on Facebook is different than a follower. And I think this is what people, or, or are they blurred now? I mean, some people follow and don't friend, or if you don't accept their friend request, they could still follow you to see your mm-hmm. public post. But there's no delineation. With, there's, what's the difference between them anymore? Well, the friend can see all of your posts if if your posts are only set, privacy is set for okay. your friends. Okay, we're all Facebook now, right? Yeah. Yeah, a friend okay. can see everything. Okay. A follower can only see what's public. Got it. Okay, so you can manage that, though. Yes. I guess uh, I'm just trying to get the the delineation between the two. Do you have a lot of tight constraints on your personal account? I mean, I, I focus on my, my personal account was my main one. Right, um, right. I Like I said, the constraints were kind of lifted when my coach was like, yeah, you just have to start accepting those followers <laughs> to build up, you know, your persona <laughs> it's a game right? it's a game it's a game so i did i did and you know what i think it's worked into my favor i've had mm-hmm. a lot of opportunities because of like being here with you today yeah. if oh, yeah. it wasn't for the social network that's how we met that. initially yes. absolutely yes these these mediums have evolved over time and if and the entrepreneur doesn't stay really focused on the changes that happen because they're kind of subtle but they do happen yes you can get lost am i right yes you can you can i mean you're an entrepreneur and you, you've been on social media for a long time well, with advertising and the sponsored posts zuckerberg is still turning down my <laughs> posts saying it's against our policy i'm like it's not i swear so, yeah so yeah. um it, and it's, it is tough you have to read up on it and you know and your background's advertising mm-hmm. so before the web not not before the web, before social media. And I don't include MySpace in social media. It was an experiment. And God bless that it happened because we wouldn't have what we have had it not happened. But let's just say late 2000s and really once Facebook started to really catch the public's attention, 2010, 11, mm-hmm. something like that. How different is the advertising industry now as opposed to before facebook oh wow okay (laughs) you have to be on social that's it people people went there kicking and screaming yeah you need to be advertising on social outlets and you need to invest into it and it's a lot more affordable Mm -hmm. google's important too I, I know like a lot of people like oh I don't want to be on Google AdWords yeah yeah no you you, you, you look at the larger you yeah. have to do both you have to do the social you have to do Google AdWords and you have to do search engine optimization mm-hmm. that's so you show up organically right. on the front page of Google they say if you want to hide a dead body put it on the second page of Google because nobody goes there <laughs> so that's a little tip for you <laughs> all right so but but you went to school for advertising so the changes you've seen you did you do advertising work before yes i did my i had i was an independent for a while okay um design graphic design and was in the web a little bit and would design the ads for the web right and then i was hired at the post gazette focusing on the sales aspect okay and prior to that I had sales experience i was a director of admissions at a college okay so that's still the sales <laughs> no question the I remember websites were such a big thing before Facebook's proliferation, mm-hmm. and websites are still a thing, but they were for the small business owner a little bit de-emphasized once Facebook came because people were using their Facebook business page as their website. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so it just it changed the whole. Uh, I asked Ethan Merritt, who's a um, an entrepreneur, does a lot on Instagram. I asked him this question off camera yesterday: Are there too many platforms? Is there congestion or is there confusion in the marketplace now? I would say you'd have to look at who your demographic is. Okay. Because, you know, you might have the younger ones on Instagram, but you still have to be on Facebook to catch, you know, the people in between. And Google 
obviously, where do people go all day long? Mm -hmm. Google to find out information. So you mm -hmm. want to show up there. So I think that once you understand it, you can differentiate through that confusion and where you need to be and how you need to go about it. Yeah. I just, I mean, it's probably because I'm getting a little bit older. Uh, I, and probably set in my ways that it's, like ugh, another social media platform like TikTok. You know? Oh yes, and it's yes. Like, and I, do I do, do? Is it important that I go learn this or not? Is this a kid's humor site for the video, or is it really? I have a Snapchat account. I probably used it twice. Mm -hmm. it, so it really comes down to understanding what mediums work best with the demographic you're trying to attract right. and the industry that you're Absolutely. in as well. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yes. And I, I want to be on Instagram and TikTok. Why? Well, I feel that if I have the right videos mm -hmm. and you look, I want to get, gain the confidence in the younger crowd so they follow me for a longer period of time. Right. I know a lot of big organizations doing that, focusing on the very young so they could follow them throughout the Yeah, it's the an investment almost. It right? is an investment. <laughs> Even banks, like one of the banks, I'm not going to say the name, but one of the local banks, I was working with the marketing director and she was like, well, we want to focus on kids while they're still in high school. Wow, how about that? And I'm like, why? And I, I know why, because she wants them to go to their parents and say, hey, they have the great program at this right. bank mom right. even though you're at your bank let's go to this bank yeah. that's what they're doing get them early yes. and build loyalty you know i have to believe you know here in pittsburgh pnc did that you know 40 years ago mm -hmm. getting families oh where do you bank well of course of course pnc mm -hmm. that was the thing of course pnc that was the thing then not so much anymore, but it was then yes. when they had this standard checking account and all that. So I don't know. Marketing is fascinating to me. And, and, and your background in advertising, you've, you had to have seen it all. I've seen some things. I mean, <laughs> I mean you have seen them all. Uh -huh. I, and, and, and just managing the landscape. So that brings me to your new talk show. Yes. Which I'm pretty excited about. Thank you. For you and, you and to watch and to see them and to get that content. Uh, and we'll talk about how you plan on advertising that. So talk about the idea. So started with In Your Face MMA. While I was interviewing the fighters and the trainers and the gym owners and the promoters, I saw that there were more people that I wanted to interview in different industries. Okay. So even though I, I let that go in 2015 and everything happened, and here I am last year, mm -hmm. January 2019, I had a, a digital advertising meeting with one of the top four automotive groups in the United States, Group One Automotive. Mm -hmm. So I'm pitching Group One Automotive in downtown Houston on the 40th floor, this beautiful building with the advertising director and the digital advertising director. And I had two media companies working with me because right. one had this product that he's going to sell <laughs> and the other one had all these other ones, great companies. So um, I had something personally because I want to invest in myself Sure. because if I'm giving everybody else an opportunity to make money off of what they're selling, what am I bringing to the table? What value am I bringing? I want to create something with myself that I bring value as an individual that I don't have to work for anybody else ever mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is like my long-term goal, doing something I'm passionate about. And I really love learning people's stories. I love right. people, especially older people, because they have way more experience that these millennials don't even can't even <laughs> grasp. I have a seventeen year old daughter. She cannot grasp the knowledge. She thinks she yeah. knows everything. That's it, life, and though. that's normal. That's you know, life, not yeah. speaking badly about her, but right. at that age I thought I knew everything. Right. Ask a teenager now while they still know Wait, everything. You mean we didn't? <laughs> right. <laughs> no one ever told me I didn't. <laughs> yeah, but that's what my mom used to say. Ask a teenager now while they still know everything. Yeah. So before they forget. Yeah. Yeah, so here I am sitting with Joe Caponegro and mm -hmm. Gary Gaia, downtown Houston, and I had this pitch for them from me. Okay, I, oh, yes, I was an independent consultant for this company. Yes, I was an independent consultant for this company. But for me personally, what was I going to pitch him? I'm just going to make my dream come true. Right on. I'm going to keep inspiring people, telling stories. And I thought, well, this could also work well for Group One. So I had a, a presentation for him. It was called One on One with Jamie Chesney. And I had all my questions for him just so he wouldn't be intimidated. He said yes. He said yes, that I could interview him on video. I was going right. to have a whole production team come with me. And my media company was going to sponsor me at that time. Right. And then 2019 was the absolute worst year of my life. Like I almost mm -hmm. didn't make it. Like mm -hmm. that's how bad the year was. So I had to put everything on hold and get all my ducks in a row with everything I was getting hit with. So I um 
went and I got an, a job, a day job. Like I had mm -hmm. to work for somebody instead of being an independent. And right. I, I went to Entercom. I love all the people at Entercom Communications. And I was there since December up through this pan the beginning mm. of the pandemic, April 3rd. The pandemic. The pandemic. Yes, get that right. The pandemic. <laughs> Her work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm like, well, after the initial fear and I realized like, okay, okay, I see what's going on here. Well, what am I going to use this time for now that it I was let go from employment mm -hmm. and what am I going to do with myself? I'm not going to sit in the house all day and watch Netflix, which I did for a couple of days. I admit <laughs> there were a couple of days I did watch Netflix. But um, from there, I thought, well, I pulled out my presentation one on one with Jamie Chesney mm -hmm. and then I did the website and I had this plan, another plan for my functional holistics with mm -hmm. um, I, I there's a whole other area of my life that I don't know if people know about, but I attempted to do three real estate develop, development deals in 2018, mm -hmm. like big deals, like multi-million dollar development deals. And from that, I had to learn about the financing. So right. I did a little bit of commercial lending and I met some great business people. And Joe Messino was one of them. And Joe was a functional nutritionist and I he gave me all kinds of these products. Some were CBD, some were right. just vitamins. Like he, he's a brilliant at it. And I said, why are you just selling to doctors? You know, you probably should do a B2C. Let's do mm -hmm. a website. He's like, set it up. I'll give you, we'll share profits. So when I was let go, um, I not only did the one-on-one -on -one with Jamie Chesney, I did my e-commerce site for Functional Holistics. I have right. a partner, did my LLC with the state. Like I have that set up, ready to launch. We have product coming in at the end of this week. And um, my, my show, I've already had two interviews. So it took me one day to do the website a year in like four months of not doing it. Talk about motivation and how that That's changes life. your yeah, efficiency. No, no question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the show is one on one. It's video and audio, similar mm -hmm. to what we're doing here. But you're on location. You will actually go yes. to. You will go to the guest. Okay. Sorry, we don't do that. No, this is beautiful. <laughs> I want something like this. I do. Well, well, okay. Thank you. Thank you. That means that means a lot to me. It does. We're obviously limited, though, and I've I had some guests that couldn't make it here that have not been on this show yet because I haven't been able to. They haven't been able to make it. Logistics and so forth. So it does limit me a little bit being so rigid. But that's just our thing here. The show is the show is here. Um, I like the idea of going. You do you know, going mobile. I do. I don't think I'll do it, but I really like it. I do. Well, I like it. There is like some it. downside. Well, number one, I'm new to doing all of this video stuff. So I did. I do have a videographer, mm -hmm. and you know she brought her cameras out. But being in front of the camera, I like. I said hi. This is Jamie Chesney <laughs> with one on one with Jamie Chesney, and I'm like, did I just say my name twice? <laughs> like, so that's on Vic's interview. Everybody, when that comes out, um, don't judge. I'm just trying to get better hey, every day. <laughs> so. My friend, you can go back and watch the early shows here. Not that you not that I'm the most polished person possible doing this. I am not, but if you do, it, it's just an experience thing. My first couple of shows. Uh, I, you know, I I cringed kind of now, oh, you know. So seeing myself on that's film. good. I mean, it's, you, like you, a... it's it's a growing process. You can definitely do it. You're you're made to do it. I mean, it's in you. Your Thank your you. personality is set. It's going to be great. I also love the aspect that you came in off camera. I asked a little bit about the show, and you said I love people's stories. Do you know how many times I have said that to people who have inquired about what we're doing? I love the story. I want to hear the story. I can't tell you why I have that bent that I want to hear people's stories. I probably should have been a bartender full time or, or possibly a psychiatrist. If I was smarter, I would have done that. I just love people's stories. I want to hear it because I think there's commonality that is found with everybody in stories. Overcoming adversity. Yeah. And yeah, that's a big that's theme one. of it. That's a huge and for I think you're centering on that, right? I mean Well, you know, a big part of that was when I was working at the Post Gazette, um, the managing director of MetLife reached out to me and he said, Jamie, I saw some videos on you. He goes, Will you be our keynote speaker wow. at the Lexus Club at PNC Park in front of, you know, a couple hundred of my insurance agents? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Wow. 
You know, like, <laughs> what, me? And his name was Barry Fastener. We're still friends. And he um, it's like, I'll coach you through it. We'll get your story down. So we spent some time. He paid me like 1500 bucks for the hour, too. Right, like, right that on. was, I'm like, maybe That's I should be rate. into speaking. <laughs> you know, rate. like, I'll share that, you know. But it rate. was like, I have to do this. I have to step up. So he helped me with it. And we talked about, you know, my experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we focused on that, really really made me like I was in tears at the end of it I was able to help at least six people came up to me mm -hmm. after my speaking session they said you've helped me so much and it's because I was supposed to be on disability when I was 28 years old I had my youngest daughter she was crawling and they told me that I had degenerative disc disease well they actually told me that when I was 23 mm -hmm. so from 23 to 28 I had severe pain I would wake up I was throwing up from it I had wow. four uh, bulging discs in my neck and two in my low back mm -hmm. and he told me the doctor Dr. Maroon mm -hmm. same doctor for the Pittsburgh Steelers said you are gonna be on disability for the rest of your life mm. and I was just mm. like not me. <laughs> I have five kids because I was married at the time. My husband had three daughters yeah, and yeah, yeah, my yeah. two daughters. So I'm like, mm, no, I don't accept that. So I did my research and I found out about degenerative disc disease and, mm -hmm. you know, traction helps that. And I learned about meditation and mindset and self healing and, and you know, white light healing. Why you hang upside down in the basement? Yep, yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> 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 inversion, they call it inversion tables. Inversion table, inversion therapy. Yeah, so, yeah. but first, I before I got to the point of what an inversion table was, I was using that device behind the that you put over the door and it oh. like lifts your neck up. Anything to help relieve the pain because yeah, I was in severe it. pain. They put me on muscle relaxers. I passed out on the floor a couple times, drooling on myself. I'm like, these drugs are not for me. I'm not a person that's yeah. good with that stuff. Yeah. So, um, from my first MRI that showed that I had stenosis in my spine. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Where the discs are bulging into the spinal canal. To so six months later, wow. I did The Power of Now with Iker Toll mm -hmm. and The Silva Method by Jose Silva, which mm -hmm. is a, a serious program with meditation. And he was an electrician in the 1940s. Amazing guy. Right. Watch, you, you would love right. it. So I would meditate while on the inversion table for six months. And now I would only be upside down for like a minute if that twice right. a day right. but then I would lay flat and I would finish my meditation right. and six months later he said your stenosis is gone what have you been doing how about that three years later I was cage fighting that's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah that's amazing so that's I told a story. That story. That's a story so and if you think about business people what are they doing all day right they're on they're on their computers they're hunched over there's their posture right. no question and six people came up to me and they said I have severe back pain I have bulging discs you've mm -hmm. helped me so much you've given me hope Wow. so these people like went and got inversion tables and right. started taking care of their spine so mm -hmm. and they were a little bit older people too just think getting outside of their box their comfort zone so obviously that made you very happy being a being of help being of service pro providing a good idea to somebody yeah and then listen to other people. That was the best feeling in the world. Just, you know, they can't, they, I had tears because they had tears, yeah. like, because I can relate to their pain. Yeah. Back up. How are you going to choose your guests? Well, I know a lot of people. Yes, you do. And your sphere is very large. <laughs> and I know very large. a lot of great people who have an inspire. I want to inspire fire people okay. I look at the news I got so sick of the news during this pandemic that I could not contain I, I just said I'm just shutting it off for a couple of days like I had no clue what was going on for like four days in a row and that was un that's kind of unheard of like right. with, with how fast things are right. changing right so um, I'm like well I really want to inspire who do I know that has mm -hmm. a story. Who have I worked with that has a story that can help me inspire other people? I want people to tune in because they know that person. They they're going to have something that they're going to take away from that. Got it. I want to teach. Got it. You know, I, I want to show people that there is a better way. Like you don't have to live with back pain. You can decide. You can choose to look into self healing and inversion mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. Like there are solutions out there if you have the drive and the will. And I I want my following those people to be seekers. People who are looking for inspiration. Maybe they're lost or maybe they're looking to get to the next level in their career and because they listen to Victor Olive and you know his 
rags to riches story that that inspired them to go get a mentor to help them you know get to where they want to be i just want to help people at this point because if we're not of service to others you know then then what are we here for who said that if we're not of service the service of others is a rent we pay for a room on earth that That's Muhammad a good Ali? phrase. That's a very good phrase. Yes. I, I don't know who said it. I've heard Muhammad it. It's Ali, a good I one. believe. It could be. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good phrase. And it's true. Sometimes it only takes like one good idea. Jim Rohn, who was, a, who was an amazing speaker, listening to him talk was life. I, I encourage anyone. Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N. But he used to say sometimes it only takes one good idea. Sometimes someone could be sitting in, in a lecture and zoning out, but they pick up one thing or they hear one thing. They overhear in a conversation. They watch a show. They listen to a podcast. They hear one thing that could be the trigger to them. And you just never know when that's going to happen. So I think any inspiring story is valid, whether there's one person or a million people listening to it or watching it, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. if, if you if you provide the opportunity to touch one person that way, it's valid. It's good. Yeah. That's what I want to do. You know? I want to change people for the better. I want to help them change themselves. I want to inspire, make, you know. Well, good. you've had Jim Shorkey on recently, oh right? Oh, my gosh. What yeah, tell me a little bit about Jim. Jim is an amazing person. So after I released um, or announced that I have Vic's interview, which will be coming out soon. Right. I need to work on some technical things. Um, Jim reached out to me. He goes, Jamie, I have a story for you. Now this is a guy who is, he was second generation automotive dealership. Right. His dad ran the dealership for years and upon his dad's passing, you know, within two years, Jim Shorkey was bankruptcy eminent in 1996. Mm. Well, 1996 his dad passed, 1998, bankruptcy eminent. And he said, I attribute that to my arrogance at that time. He said, I was arrogant. And he's, he went and did this workshop where, you know, your red column or green column. And he, was, he went to school for math, so he knew his math. And he's like, you know, you're here, you're here, you're here, or bankruptcy eminent. And he was at the very bottom. He's like, that can't be um, Jim Shorkey, I'm not bankrupt. So he did the math again. And he's like, oh, my gosh. And, now he, and he thought about his dad. And he said, I cannot let this dealership go under. So what did he do? He, he read a lot of books you know and one of the things is seek expert counsel mm -hmm. so he goes to his dad's partner mr hamilton mr hamilton what do i do and he goes these are the 10 things right now you do these 10 things and he he listened and then every day he he read think and grow rich mm -hmm. 142 times mm -hmm. now in the book it says you have to read it three times yes Okay. Very familiar with it. 142 times. I bought my, I bought, I had the book. He can recite ago. it to you by now. <laughs> <laughs> I lost it in the fire. I lost it in the fire. That's how long ago it was for me. But I bought three copies, hardbacks, one for each of my daughters and myself. And even though my youngest is 11, she promised me that she will read it three times before mm -hmm. she's 20. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. But so Mr. Shorkey, um, he had to humble himself. And he turned that dealership around, and now his he's retired, and his children are running it, and there's nine dealerships. Right. Like, what a success story. He's right. well taken care of, and now he's dedicating his retirement to giving back. And he started that Rethink You Results from Thinking mm -hmm. program that is based off of the 6,000 books he's read, including a lot with Think and Grow Rich. Right. So It's um, a life-changing book, and that, and that book is the centerpiece of many accomplished people's stories that actually that, listen to it. And Napoleon Hill's book, Thinking Grow Napoleon Hill, Thinking Grow Rich. You can buy a used copy on Amazon for seventy nine cents. Something that could change your life is seventy nine cents. The words in there, I mean, and Napoleon's a, he's a weird guy. There's a little, you know, if you and I only know that because I also read his autobiography. Okay, and Napoleon's a little bit of a different kind of guy, but. It's a life-changing book, and it has been for many, many successful people, especially in business. Now, the one thing about that book, like it, reading it once, I mean, you're going to see something different every time. Mm -hmm. Like I just started going through it again, and I'm picking up things. But what Jim Shorkey has done has taken those concepts and simplified it for 
and, and modernized it right. for today. Right. So every morning you can go on. He's there faithfully. Every morning, 9 a.m., Jim Shorkey on Results from Thinking on his Facebook, he's going live. And I, I've been listening to him the past three mornings. So inspiring. That, that man, 62 years old, so much energy. Right. And he wants to live until he's 123 years old. <laughs> and I believe he'll do it. I really believe he'll do it. He has it figured out. And there's there's another book that goes, I mean, you think about the mindset. And I, th I think part of Think and Grow Rich is, is, I don't know if you've heard of The Secret, too. Mm -hmm. That's another thing, like more of a, the woman's. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What's your thoughts on The Secret? Um, I mean, I think some of the concepts are um, a lot the, the same. It's just put off in a different way. Desire, I, believe, receive. I would agree. It's, it's a repackaged and a re... Yeah. My, um, it, it, I think it goes back to Napoleon Hill. It does. It does. But I will tell you, the positive of The Secret is, is it took Napoleon Hill's work and made it more palatable for a lot of people. Yeah. It opened, it opened Napoleon Hill's concepts up to the public. Only slight negative that I would say is I, I've i listened to some people that have bought into that, Jamie, and they really think that mantras and thinking and mantras and thinking is the crux of it, and they don't put the effort and action in it because... You have to execute. It, it, it's, uh, again, another Jim Rohn quote. It's, it's very simple. Um it, it was um, affirmations without action is the beginning of delusion. <laughs> yeah, that's a great line. I like that. I've always that. remembered that yes. because you could affirm something to yourself a million times. Right. But unless you really take the physical action, I think, that, and I don't know if the action part of the secret was really there. Was, I don't either because I felt like on, I was missing something from that. Yeah, I really do. I, and again, you know, I, and I, but I, I think you, there's no magic in terms of like, esoteric magic you've got to physically go do the work too right but the, no question you're going to be better at the work if your mindset's right absolutely right i think that's i don't, I don't know maybe, maybe just maybe that's too black no. and white for some people but i think that uh that's not real glossy or sexy for hollywood the secret but um it's true it's jim shorky's message it is it may not be completely original in all of its aspects but the way he presents his uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the way he presents his program and how he's aligned all these concepts together, that's his. Yeah, that, that, oh, he that's says his. he's a copycat. He just said it this morning. He is, I'm not that great. I'm a copycat. And he was like, but I'm copying good stuff. So Absolutely right. So And, and I think he has a great following and mm -hmm. he's made an impact on his children. He said they tried to change um, his philosophy. You know, in the beginning it was like, first, you love the customer. You love the customer and you love the team. Okay, so um, they they tried changing some things to that, and it always goes back to it. So with with Jim Shorkey, he has four children, and can you imagine the legacy that he's leaving right. for them? They're running the dealerships right. now. He's he's like I'm completely out of it. People think that I'm in it. He's like no, I I I'm doing this rethink you. I want to give back. I want to help people. He's not making any money on it. Right. He's helping his two partners, Chuck and Steve, and Chuck's fighting cancer right now Ma. he's in the hospital doing his live facebook i'm like what <laughs> what is happening here and he's that dedicated and it's believes awesome. in it so much and it's based awesome. off of the concepts think and grow rich and the other books um uh, roan as well yeah jim roan is a big part of my story jim passed in 09 uh difficult difficult for me personally but, but a tremendous part of my story came into my life at a time that i needed it it was that nugget of information at a time where the human needed it. And I was, by, by the grace of God, I was able to grab that nugget and then hold on. And, yeah. and he pulled me out of it. Does that make any sense? The philosophy Absolutely. pulled me out of it. Yeah, so that's just my unique story. With There's a lot of great messages out there too. and it, But it really comes down to you got to believe in yourself, right? Absolutely, number one. It starts there. And honestly, I struggle with that. Always well, we have. all do society's telling you that life's really hard and you know it's, it's okay if you can't do something no it's not it's not, <laughs> it's right? not okay because you're failing yourself yeah jim shorky I, i've been watching um results from thinking yes is that is that is that his thing yes okay so who else you have um can you leak any other guests that are coming 
If well, you don't, if you can't, yes, you can't. absolutely. If you can't, you can't. My BFF, Al Levine, the talking machine. <laughs> He'll love this. <laughs> um, I'm meeting him on Tuesday at Lula and Swickley. Stephen's my friend, the owner. Yeah. And he's like, we're closed, but yeah, come on in. Have the show here. It's a great thing to do. Yeah. So yeah. I was getting him some publicity for Lula Restaurant. Absolutely. You know, how restaurants are struggling right mm -hmm. now. So I just wanted to do something good, you know, where I can get him some recognition, have my friend. Because Al and I, we can meet anywhere. Like, he'd come to my house. I could go to Al's house. Right. But Lula and Swigley, that's so much sexier, don't you think? No question. <laughs> and and it's a, I think it's a really cool and hip background and environment to do shows. And I kind of, I'm intrigued by the on-location thing. I am. Yeah. I'm kind of married well, to this place, but I'm, I'm intrigued by well, it. Well, listen, you're very high-tech. My high tech uh, is coming. You ready for this? <laughs> Went on Amazon last night and I purchased a tripod with one of those makeup lights oh, and a how microphone. About that? How about so that? we're moving up with that, one on one with Jamie Chesney. You, that's what you need, though. <laughs> then that, and that's very mobile and that's going to serve you well. I hope so. Yeah, I think, and in the end, Yes, you want to be polished and professional and all that, but in the end, it comes down to content and quality of guests and getting the guests to engage, right? Yes. And your personality is, is you're going to be great for it. Thank There's no you. Doubt. I hope so. I have a lot of things I need to get over, you know, like film does add 10 pounds. <laughs> I was like, can you like cut off my butt? <laughs> See, can you crop it so that whole side of my body is out of there? Because that looks, you know, I seriously did that. In, in the end, the aesthetics of it all, it, it's important. The show's got to look good. It doesn't need to look overly glossy, but the content needs to be there. I mean, um, is there, are there any shows out there that are doing kind of what you're doing um, doing that on-site mobile one-on-one -on -one kind of thing that it did or did you can take ideas from because I, I make I no bones know. about it this, If Joe Rogan had not existed, this would not be here. Really? Yeah, yeah. Rogan was my number one influence wow. We're different than him, but that was my number one influence. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean the format the format the uh, the, the close proximity to the studio the table the whole thing it, it works for me yeah it's beautiful it I'm, I'm it, jealous like I well want it's not original <laughs> it's not original but is there any shows that you've seen like that, that have been like an inspiration to you? no it's actually magazines as a teenager like 17 magazine and <laughs> really <laughs> yeah I mean I saw the ads I used to read them back to front um, <laughs> wow. look at the stories and read the stories about people mm -hmm. and you know and how the ads were put in there and I'm like well my in your face MMA we'll call it an online magazine right and right, I'll have right. I had a community page with all of my fighter friends gyms and trainers and the media and the promotions mm -hmm. I had links to all their sites just to show like I want to support the community yeah and tell these stories so mm -hmm. from that it, knowing that the next step was video and then I stopped doing the show. That's how one-on-one um, -on -one evolved. Got it. The it, it's it's a crowded medium that we're in right now. When you use the word podcast, yeah, I don't use that. I, yeah, I, I, but I will tell you that it's a wonderful medium, and we're not. Uh, thank goodness, we're not required or we're not regulated. To, we're not required to act a certain way or not use certain words. <laughs> we're not regulated at all. So, well. which is which is great. I love that. I love all of that. I love the fact that um, it's kind of like the Wild West. I do like that. <laughs> yes. The internet's kind of like the Wild <laughs> yeah, West. It is. And as long as you're not hurting anybody, yeah, you know, you can you can market yourself. Well, you have way. to be careful for things like defamation of character, getting permission, mm -hmm. depending on if you mention somebody's name. And I've experienced that in the past. So. Yeah. Things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to hurt anybody. But, right. But I mean, it's we're not dispensing any. I'm not dispensing any advice. Or I'm not claiming to be a medical professional, or an, I'm not an expert in anything. Believe me, I'm not even. Ex I don't even like the word expert. Expert. I am not an expert in real estate. I'm not an expert in podcasting. I'm just somebody who's engaged and enjoys it. That's all. Same. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's. Um, are there any podcasts out there now or any shows at all that, that you watch that, that you can pull from or you, that can give you an idea? Um, I should. At, I probably should do maybe more not. research. Maybe not. I mean, just like with In Your Face MMA, I didn't look at anything else. I just you did my thing. You're not required to. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you should do your research and see what the competition is. That's a basic business rule. Mm. Got to know what your competitors are but doing. But is there competition in this no, right I'm, now? No, I'm being organic and creative. Yes. For inspiration to do a good thing. Yes. That's what I want to do. So, and I think that is the way, that's the attitude. I think that's a great attitude. Darius Chisholm was on 
here my first really? year. Oh, she was yeah, she was great. And I'm expecting her back on here soon, right, Dareth? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um she is such a polished journalist and, and, and T V presenter and video presenter. But she said to me off camera, she goes, Look, all that stuff's great, but the content's gotta be really something that people can connect with. If you can find people that got compelling stories. And I kept that in the back of my mind. It was very good advice mm-hmm. from someone who's very accomplished in what she does. Um but there's plenty of opportunity. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? I yeah, I don't know where it's gonna go. I, I know that one thing is I'm not gonna quit. Mm-hmm. Like I did, I regret quitting in your face MMA, but I was I was kind of lost, you mm-hmm. know, after breaking my hand, couldn't, yeah. you know, and losing my house, and Life. divorce, and you know, all Life. those things at once. Life. Um, that really was difficult. I was in a seven year court battle. I could be an attorney. I did pro se. I even did an appeal myself. Wow. You know, like honestly, wow. I should have gone to law school, but I hate lawyers. No offense. <laughs> I do like some lawyers. There's I do some like great ones. There There's are some, some great, great people, I and know I, some great I, ones. I plan on having a couple on my show that I love and respect. Smart move. But, uh, we, we've had Rocco Coza on this show. I Who's love Rocco. Rocco? Oh. Oh, I was planning on having him on the show. He's tremendous. He's tremendous. He's and doing a, great things. TED Talks. What? He, Rocco? Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> he's, but he's he's also a big picture thinker. Mm-hmm. He's a deep thinker as well too, and someone who really believes in uh, the the essence of being self confident and taking ownership of your circumstances. And he's got some interesting thoughts on the lightness, the light and the dark of your of your soul, and being in touch with both sides of who you are. Which stuff it was pretty compelling to me. Great, great guy. Yeah, yeah he yeah. focuses on um, kindness in business. Is what his one book is on the that's Alpha a, Way. That's yeah, I've read yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah. And we we went through that book on the show almost almost chapter by chapter, and it really. It's excellence through kindness. It's growing your business through kindness. And that's a great concept. I love it. Yeah, it's a great we concept. We need more of that. I think a lot of people who are so focused on success that they think that they just need to make all the right moves in a row, and that kindness portion gets put aside because business first. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's really the other way around. And, that, and I think that's an old way of doing business. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be an old way, but... You just get, and it's the old additive. You get so much, uh, you get so many more flies with honey, right? Okay. All right. And it's just, it's the same in business, friends and family and business. Although family, sometimes you want to kill them. But. <laughs> <laughs> I hear but, you. Uh, this has been great. I wish you the very best. You, you always have an open seat here. Can't wait for you to come back on. Thank you. In a couple of months, give us an update on the show. Uh, we'll be watching. It's one on one with Jamie. Yes. Is it Jamie Chesney or is this Jamie? Jamie Chesney, but each time it's going to be one on one with Victor Olive or one on one with Jim Shorkey or one on one with Eric McKenna. Oh, uh, I don't know if I got a story you want to tell. Oh, um, <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and uh, but you always have a welcome seat here. How can they reach you? What's the best way to reach you? Um, Facebook's good. Okay. Yeah. Jamie, just just go type in Jamie Chesney on Facebook, and is the. Uh, is your show page already created there? Yep, one it on is. one with Jamie Chesney. Yeah. One on one with Jamie Chesney. The show, the show page there. Go yes. there. Facebook, like. There's also Instagram. Um, Instagram's coming, but I do have Jamie dot Chesney as my Instagram. It's just Google her. You're gonna, <laughs> if, you're, if you can't find her, you're not looking very hard. <laughs> thank you, my friend. Thank you. All right, wish you the very best. All right, do it again. Yes. All right. Thank you. We are out. What do you think? <laughs>